So uh, thank you everyone for staying so late to hear my presentation. I know it's last, I know you're probably tired after the, after the long day, but um, I think it's going to be a good one to kind of close the whole circle uh, around after everything you've heard today. So first of all, I, I just want to say I'm so glad to, to see you all. Uh, I, I think this program is amazing and it's really awesome to see so many people interested in entering the, the industry and, and learning how to do things. I know some of you maybe already have some experience, some of you are just starting. Uh, but I'm super, super happy to, to see more new faces because from the experience, like making games is the best job in the world. And uh, I just want to, to welcome you all to, to the industry. And I, I have to say, after listening the first kind of presentations, I'm amazed with what you came up in such a short time. It's super cool and I can't wait to see, hopefully, all of these uh, somehow uh, embodied in, in, in a game. Cool. So, uh, the idea with this, what I'm going to present you, uh, please tell me if you cannot hear me well, if I turn or whatever. Uh, so, the idea is that I present you what, what it takes to have one game developed from the beginning to an end in terms of production cycle, in terms of uh, project management, pipelines, stuff like that. So, uh, the idea is to just cover all the basics, to give you some helpful tips, uh, helpful hints, how you can organize on a smaller scale, and uh, hence the name tutorial level. So uh, first I will introduce you to the idea of a producer and what a producer does in the industry. It's uh, somehow an elusive role that uh, not everybody knows exists. Uh, then I'm going to tell you a little bit about the production pipeline, of course, and uh, try to focus more on how to scale the AAA size production to a smaller size production. And uh, of course, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how producers care for people and why people are the most important in, the, in, making, uh, in making games and eventually give you some hopefully helpful tips. First of all, even though I started already, <laughs> let me introduce myself a little bit and uh, try to give myself some credibility that I know what I'm talking about. This is me. So my name is Melitza. I am an associate producer in Ubisoft Belgrade, and uh, I have uh, around 10 years of experience, maybe a bit more, uh, in game industry. And uh, I worked in the different uh, companies. I worked in different uh, I, uh, in Serbia. Uh, I worked in different genres and, and different video games. I published uh, several video games uh, in different platforms like mobile and uh, consoles and cloud and whatever. Uh, hopefully successfully <laughs> during those years. And um, even though I work as a producer now, I started actually in art. Uh, I come from graphic design, uh, that's what I studied, and uh, my first job in the industry was as a graphic designer. I first started working on UIs, uh, HUDs, stuff like that. Uh, so after some time, I kind of progressed naturally to more of a leadership roles inside the art departments, uh, to team leads, creative direction, uh, that kind of road, uh, and that kind of road led me to becoming producer eventually. Uh, so, uh, just a little bit more about me. I'm not here by chance. I'm ridiculously passionate about video games. I played video games since I was like this big, since I could reach the keyboard <laughs> of uh, Commodore 64. And uh, you mentioned uh, Prince of Persia 2008. My first game was Prince of Persia 1989, uh, actually. <laughs> so. Um, that, that's where everything started. Uh, the, the first moment you play a video game, it just it hits you or it doesn't. And if it hits you, you're eventually here. So that's a little bit uh, about me. Uh, yeah, uh, also uh, I am, aside from just working in the video games, I am a Women in Games ambassador for Serbia. And it's a huge important uh, thing for me, the equality and equity in the industry. And I really want to work on it. So I'm super happy to see a lot of women here today and hopefully we can grow and we can be more because there's not enough women, not nearly enough in the industry. Cool. And uh, this is where I work and why it's so fucking awesome.
Okay, so let's talk about who are the producers. Uh, it's a role that's sometimes kind of hard to define, not because we are some kind of medical beings, but because in different companies, in different teams, even in the same company, there's a, there are different expectations of the same role. Uh, because producers cover quite a large uh, array of things that they do during the production cycle, and it changes quite a lot if you're in the conception phase or if you're in the live phase of the game. Uh, that's why it's kind of hard to pinpoint what exactly, uh, what exactly we do. But I'll try to clarify that a little bit and give you a bit more visibility on what it all can uh, take into account. First and main responsibility of a producer is to make sure the game gets done. More often than not, games are postponed, games do not get done, so that's why we are here to make sure everything comes together and eventually the game comes out and goes to players. That's the that's number one uh, thing that we need to do, to deliver the game, deliver it on time, deliver it in, in the budget and make sure it's a quality game. In order to do that, a uh, producer must make sure that everything runs smoothly inside the team. So uh, to remove all the roadblocks, to plan things, to organize, to organize different departments, to sometimes uh, act as a translator between different roles, like programmers and artists don't speak the same language, you need to come in between and help them uh, make sure that everyone is on the same page, that everyone is aligned, that everyone knows what they should be doing. So that's a part of what the producer does, mostly just organizing and syncing people, ensuring that everyone is following the same vision, we're all going to the same place, we're all navigating the same thing. Good producer should uh, help you unblock, help you remove all the roadblocks that can wait, you, uh, wait for you down the road, and hopefully even remove some before developers even come to them. So you need to be sneaky and to figure out what's going to happen, use your experience and uh, try to overcome problems before you reach them. Uh, also in uh, bigger projects, uh, in, in bigger uh, companies, producers also uh, sometimes worry about budgets, about staffing, about making sure that you have all the resources you need, uh, also like um, even software and stuff like that. So everything that you need, uh, you the important thing is you, need, you don't need to think about anything else but your expertise and everyone in the team can do what they do best and not think about anything else because it's our job to think about everything else. So, producers are first managers. They, play, they plan, they organize the teams, uh, they organize the team uh, time, energy, tasks, deliverables, uh, milestones, and, and so on. Basically, they serve the team. Uh, then, producers are also leaders. They uh, lead the team towards the same vision, towards the same mission. Uh, they inspire, they motivate the team. Uh, they uh, try to connect the right people and help them overcome the, their problems, also grow as, uh, as professionals. They're problem solvers, and uh, mostly because they are kind of a knowledge hub for everything about the game they're making, uh, they answer a lot of questions. Like, uh, I think 50% of my day, even more, is just answering questions, random questions uh, from anyone. So uh, that's one of your biggest things, and the other is uh, solving problems in the most creative ways that you can find, because it's usually not that straightforward to do. And finally, producers are kind of a, uh, you know the saying, jack of all trades, master of none. So this is actually a good thing for a producer. You know a lot of things. Uh, you do not need to be an expert in each of the fields because it would be, you, it couldn't be possible to be uh, an expert programmer, an expert artist, an expert sound designer, and so on. But you need to know enough about all of those uh, in order to understand them good and you know, in order to help people uh, connect and do what they do best. Uh, so that's the idea. You need to know a lot about a lot of things. <laughs> And uh, that, that's usually why producers come from inside the studio. It's, uh, it's not that uh, often that you hire a producer from the outside, because uh, when you come from the inside the studio, when you kind of grow from another role, you already seen, you've seen things. <laughs> you, you, know, uh, you know how things work from the inside. Uh, that's why uh, usually QA is uh, the best possible starting position for someone to, to grow into a producer role because they literally know everything about the game. Uh, this is a little bit more about the kind of uh, producer roles in the AAA. You have uh, 
associate producers, senior producers, and executive producers. It's really, um, uh, there, there are much more <laughs> finesse between those, but I'm trying to kind of simplify this. Um, and it's really different. For example, uh, I worked as a full producer in a, in a smaller company and I had a lot less work and a lot less responsibilities than I have as an associate producer in AAA. So it's really, it's really different. Uh, so as an associate producer in AAA, you are responsible for one part of the game. So one uh, set of features, one part of the system, uh, one part of the map or however you want to say it. So one bigger part of the game, that's your responsibility. Then you have uh, one or two uh, producers or senior producers per game. Uh, associate producers, there are quite a lot uh, in, the, in, the, in one production. And the senior producers and producers, there are usually one or two per game. And they are responsible for like the bigger picture. They are responsible for all the associate producers and their deliveries. And then finally, you have executive producers. Uh, they're usually more oriented towards the business side and not exactly towards the development and production itself. They are more um, kind of like uh, franchise producers. So you would have one executive for an Assassin's Creed or something like that. Uh, and producers are per specific title. Okay, uh, so how do you use this uh, and try to translate it into the teams that you're going to have. And I really suggest you, you have uh, someone in your team that's going to, one or more person that, 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 are, that are going to kind of try and cover this. So, of course, there are going to be many times in the production when you will want, and when I say you, I usually mean game designers, you're the worst. I'm kidding, I love you. It's just that game designers have the tendency to keep adding stuff to the game even when the game is done, and almost to the, to the players, game designers are like, yeah, but they're one thing. Could we add that? And usually we do, but <laughs> it's important thing to have someone to remind you of the timelines, to remind you of the budget, to remind you, hey guys, we really need to get this game delivered. Let's maybe add that feature in the life cycle. Let's add it in post-launch, whatever. But let's just finish this game. So you need to have someone who will be able to to be the tiebreaker, to, to uh, make the decision to cut, to say, okay, we cut this, this is where, where we uh, draw the line, we deliver this game. I really recommend you having someone in your team dedicated to, to following that, to basically trying to act like a producer in a way. And uh, you don't have to, it, usually in smaller teams and in the teams uh, where I work, producer is also like a generalist. So, uh, I used to be an artist and a producer, so it can be a game designer who has a knack for organization, it can be uh, an artist who has more like a organizational side to them, uh, it, it can be anyone who will do another role, but also like on the side uh, try to follow up and try to organize the team and then keep everyone on the same track. I, I really recommend even where if you, you will be in the smaller teams, it's really it can be crucial to have someone remind you that it can be a difference between delivering game and not delivering the game. So, I kind of hope anyone plays D&D here, but even if you're not, uh, you play some RPGs. So, this is my build for a producer. So, strength and intelligence, you'll rely on others. <laughs> Let's be honest, that's the jack of all trades kind of trait. Uh, you will uh, rely on others' expertise. Uh, so you will have an expert programmer who is going to tell you how to uh, estimate or how to like, tackle the programming problems. And that's why you don't have to have that high of an intelligence rate. But you need to be dexterous as, because you need to be agile, you need to be able to kind of uh, to be fluid, to, to, to be able to, to uh, accommodate different things that are happening to you. And uh, I think Dex is a really strong trait for, uh, for a producer. Also wisdom, because wisdom is uh, impacting the insight, the perception and persuasion. Those are the traits that, uh, that's why I put it in proficiencies. I think it's really important. Like insight is super important to know when to recognize the BS. When someone is telling you something and you need to like insight check. Are you really saying this? Are you really thinking this? Is this estimate really gonna take five months? No, it's not. So you need to be able to inside check things and you also need to be able to, to recognize things from the, from
from experience. Um, then perception al also kind of aligns with what I talked about uh, using um, recognizing problems before they come on. So uh, seeing uh, the goblins before they see you, something like that. And persuasion because a lot of producer's job is to negotiate and to uh, get what you need for the team from other people. Um, survival is just because <laughs> delivery of the game is a survival, especially the more you're going towards the end, it's, yeah, you're going to see, <laughs> it's going to be awesome. So yeah, that's that. Now uh, let's talk, no, let's drink some water. Let's talk a little bit about the production pipeline. I think this is the this is where we're going to talk about the most. And uh, I'm going to cover the usual production pipeline and the stages of development. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about project management strategies that you can use for your team. And uh, I'm going to try to talk from the perspective of a scale of an indie team. So I'm not going to present you the whole AAA uh, production pipeline because I think that's uh, applicable for, for your context. So um, this is a super simplified version of a production stages. So you have uh, the conception phase, you have pre-production uh, phase, you have production phase, and you have live. Uh, of course, in AAA, you will have uh, much more uh, smaller milestones and you have more complexity inside of these. But this is really what, what, you, what you need, well, what you will need for any kind of game you're making. If it's a small, hyper-casual mobile title, or if it's a AAA game, this is kind of the uh, same thing. So in the conception phase, that's kind of where you are right now. You're uh, figuring out the, the game ideas, you're defining the vision, you're working on it together, you, you maybe do some kind of prototyping, test the, um, test the engines, test the, the tech that you're going to use, just kind of prepare for what you're going to do and make sure that um, everyone is aligned on the vision and on the game concept that you're going to work on. If everyone is aligned and you're like, you review this, you feedback, you, you went through the loop, if it's all cool, you kick off the production here. So uh, in the pre-production phase, this is where you go more in depth into like uh, design DNA or game design Bible or whatever uh, different uh, different people call it, uh, so also a narrative bible, that's where you focus more like in-depth uh, working in the, in the, on the details of the game. And uh, that's where I would put like a first playable build, uh, also someone might call it like an MVP or a minimum viable product, but we call it a first playable build. And first playable is uh, I think maybe one of the most important milestones in game production because this is what uh, this is what showcases the core experience of your game. So it needs to cover all the features, the systems, the, the, the game scope, the world scope. It doesn't have to have all of the features complete, but it needs to just show like a vertical slice of the experience that you want to, your game to have. And this is, the, this is the moment where things can turn. So if you're first playable, once you deliver it, you need to test it thoroughly. And I don't mean like bug testing, but testing for feedback ask people uh, to play your game, to give you feedback, to see if, it's, if it hit your vision, if you, if you hit the, the mark that you wanted to hit. So if you, if you did, that's amazing, good job, continue. But if, if it's not, now is the perfect time to go back to the drawing board and start again. It doesn't mean start from, from scratch, but now is the time where you don't make compromises, when you don't say, oh, we went so far, now let's continue with what we have. No, you don't do that because it, continues to pile up, pile up, pile up until the end of the game. Now, if uh, in first playable, you sit with your team, you got your reviews, uh, you play the game, and you like sit and read all the feedbacks, and you're like, no, this is not aligned on the vision that we wanted to have, go back to the drawing board, go back to the conception phase. So uh, let's say you delivered your first playable, it was awesome, everyone loved it, you hit the mark. Next step is the production cycle. That's the that's kind of the biggest part of the production, uh, the longest, and this is where we have a uh, few milestones. Uh, it's, it has alpha milestone, beta milestone, closed beta, open beta, uh, gold master, and uh, release. So uh, alpha stage is the stage where what you had in first playable, you now uh, have throughout all of the game. So if in first playable you had the level one of your game, which showcases all the game mechanics and everything. Uh, alpha phase is where you get to the end game. 
if end game is applicable for your game. So maybe it's not, but it's where you have everything your game needs to have. No more adding after that, that's the idea. In beta phase is where you have the alpha phase, but looking good, basically. It's uh, the polish phase, is the phase that you make things work smoothly, uh, you polish your art, you add in uh, animations, you add in the sound, like the pizzazz, you add the pizzazz in, in beta phase. So that's kind of it. When you reach the beta, your game is done, so to say. Uh, then you have closed beta, where you usually you would give your game to someone uh, from outside the company, uh, from outside the team, but like small circle of people that you trust to kind of give you the, the, the feedback and to try and fix the small things that you have. Also try to bug hunt and try to make the game uh, not wonky. Uh, then you have open beta that's mostly used for promotional purposes because you would release it uh, a little bit before the final release of the game to try and get more people in, to try and get some feedback before the, uh, before the final final. And uh, after that, Gold Master usually means you passed all the tests. And uh, in bigger productions, if you're, for example, if you're publishing the game for Sony, Microsoft, uh, Google, uh, Nintendo, whatever, they all have their own set of rules what you need to like check the boxes to, in order to, to publish the game on their platforms. And uh, before Gold Master, that's what you do. You go to all of those compliances and they all test your game, they rip it apart, and uh, then you fix things, and they rip it apart, and you fix things, and once uh, everyone is satisfied with what you've done, you get the Gold Master. We, we call it Gold ma Master because uh, it used to be like an actual golden disc, uh, but now we don't have discs anymore, so <laughs> it's still a Gold Master. And once you reach the Gold Master, you can release the game, and uh, voila, that's that. As soon as you release the game, you start gathering feedback, uh, you already know the things that you didn't have the time to work on, you already know the things that don't work but you still went with it, and first, after the live, you first work on patches, on live patches and patching the game, adding a few smaller stuff, and then you see how people react, and uh, that's where the live phase starts, uh, that's where you continue to build your game if you want your game to be live, if you don't want your game to be live, then that's the end of the cycle and your game is forever in the ether. All right, uh, please, if you have any questions while I'm doing this, don't, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, like sorry, I, I didn't hear. Yeah, it's pretty much the same, only you would call early access uh, maybe somewhere around alpha phase, something like that. But now it's really hard to define that because a lot of indie games um, do it for the, for the money and they go <laughs> into like early access way, before, uh, way long before the game is actually playable. I don't think it's a good thing. Uh, I mean, I honestly don't, so uh, to each their own. I'd say, but for me, the only thing that would make sense is uh, after the alpha phase, so your game kind of, it works, it's just not that pretty. If you want to give it to people to, to try, it's cool. But I think before, uh, before alpha, it really doesn't make sense. It's not playable, it shouldn't be playable. Um, but yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, it's a really good question. So, I in AAA it's a bit easier because you have uh, you have a lot of people with a lot of experience that you can turn to. So, for example, when you're in the conception phase, you have uh, uh, something we call editorial team. Those are all the VPs, uh, the high directors that usually you present the game to them and they give you the, the feedback. And ooh, it's like a super contrast now. 
So uh, if they say yes, it's a good thing. And if they say no, it's not. But internally in the team, we also uh, usually turn to people with more experience uh, because in a company like Ubisoft, you really have access all the time to people who have like 20 years of experience in the industry. It's crazy. And you can just ping them on chat and like, hey, how do you like this? So it's kind of easy to, to have this. So I'd say uh, it, it, in an indie team, I would use something, okay, it's disco now. No, don't worry, I, I just, my ADHD is not letting me continue <laughs> this sentence. No, no, uh, so um, in a smaller company, it would make sense to reach out to uh, other people that you know more, know more than you. So uh, this is a good opportunity to network and to meet people that actually have a lot of experience. So if you're stuck somewhere and you're not sure, like you cannot be sure in the team, you're, you think it's a good idea, but you're not quite sure, I would really recommend uh, asking for outside opinion because you will look into this game so long that you will stop seeing it objectively and you really need an objective opinion from the outside. That's, that's why we have a team that's detached from every other team that gives us uh, feedback because they can be objective. And that's the same thing you do. You just make your own, like, um, uh, I don't know, like masters <laughs> that, you are, that you go to, that you ask to, uh, for opinion. You can also ask a well, layman, you can ask your mom, it's, it's also going to help, honestly, it's going to help. But if you're looking for a specific answer, it's really cool to ask someone from, uh, from the industry. And uh, I'm going to maybe mention it several times during the presentation, but do, do not be afraid to reach out to people who, who are working in the industry, who, has, uh, like, who have like million, million years of experience, because they're, they're available to you and they will never tell you like, no, I don't want to tell you that or I don't want to help you because that's the beauty of game development. Uh, everyone is so eager to share and to, everyone has opinions so, and they want to share them. So uh, yeah, re reach out, to that. that's them. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Of course. Uh, more and more game dev uh, relies on data, like every other industry. So even in the conception phase, you will think about that. You, you need to, uh, yeah, sorry, sorry, I didn't mention it. It's a really good point. You need to know who your end user is. And uh, we have a lot of data on how people use our games, what they uh, play the most, what they play the least. Um, you have different types of players. I'm maybe not the, the best person to tell you about that. You'll have it in probably narrative. But you, you have uh, social players that focus on social gameplay. You have uh, explorers, you have achievers, you have completionists. So you need to know who you're targeting with your game and, and use that. Uh, so we use a lot of data that we already have, but also after you uh, go to after beta phase, uh, you take a lot of uh, feedback from, from outside players. So we have groups of players that we, uh, they're like closed, uh, so under NDA and everything, uh, that we turn to for different types of games. So uh, if we're making a social game, we'll turn to a social group of players that are hardcore social players, and we'll ask them for their opinions. It's, those are really complex testings and uh, results that we use. Yeah, sure, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I don't hate n n n neither, uh, but I kind of like the most the conception phase. It's the most fun one uh, when you you're just like ideas, ideas, yeah. ideas, Whoop! ideas, <laughs> and. Uh, that's the, that's the most creative part, so to say. But it doesn't mean that you won't get a lot of creative things to do during the production. It's not like set in stone. It, the game design changes so many times during the production. But that's kind of maybe the, the most interesting one. And then the uh, closing of the game is super crazy, but extremely interesting because you worked on something for like, in AAA you worked on something for like five years, and now it's finally the time for, for people to see it. It's, 
there's no feeling like that. Like the expectations and fear and dread, and then you like uh, refresh Reddit like thousand times a day and read comment. It's the best. <laughs> like it's honestly no, nothing beats that. Uh, so yeah, I'd say conception and the very very end. It's not that the others are not fun. The, everything is fun. Yeah. Any more questions about the production pipeline? Cool. Uh, then let me move on. I'll leave room for Q and A afterwards, of course. But uh, if you have anything, ask me. So uh, next is I'm going to go a little bit more in depth what happens inside of these production stages uh, in terms of just organization and how we manage to have those in side the deadlines mm, sometimes. So uh, first, th first thing is uh, that you as a project manager need to do is uh, define. So you need to define what work needs to be done uh, in terms of uh, like uh, art and uh, uh, programming and sound and whatnot. Then you need to estimate that work to know how much it's going to cost, cost in, time, in terms of time and uh, money. Uh, then you work out the dependencies between teams, between uh, different teams that sometimes cannot work at the same time. You need to wait for someone to finish before you can start. Then, of course, you work on your, on your tasks and uh, keep aligning everyone to know we're all on the same page. And in the end, you implement uh, what you've done into the game. And finally, you review. And you review a lot. You go back and you review and you review a lot. So uh, this is kind of the, the, uh, the cycle that you're going to go through all the time. Define what you need to do, estimate it, uh, define dependencies, work on things, align, implement, and review. And uh, you need to think about all, like, uh, you all come from different uh, job families in a way, and you're going to be uh, working together. So you need to be aware of uh, different needs for, you need to do all of these steps for all of these uh, uh, job families basically for game design, for narrative, for level design, then you have art and in art you have uh, the UI, you have uh, level art, you have character art, animation, environment, uh, then you have different types of programming and different types of, types of sound uh, design and finally you have testing and you need to do these steps for, for all of these in order to kind of fit everything and you know what you need to do. So. Uh, the idea that I'm going to give you today is uh, there are a lot. Ooh, I covered this. Probably shouldn't do that. Uh, the idea is to to try and uh, give you s somehow like maybe a cheat sheet on how to use this. I don't want to talk to you about all the different project management methodologies. There are a lot, and I don't think it matters anyway because usually productions use some kind of a, like a Frankenstein of different project management. I. That, that they that fit to their, to their needs basically they don't just use scrum from to the T they, they usually mix it up so uh, the idea behind agile is this it was mentioned today also in a different uh, presentation it's really maybe it's already a, a cliche but it's really super important to uh, fail fast fail often it means that as sooner you make a mistake you will learn from it, you will fix it, and you will move on. You will, you will have a chance to, to fix it. The, if you realize you failed at the end of your game, at the end of your project, it's way too late. If you really realize you failed in the first two weeks of your project, it's perfect. You, you have a lot of time to fix it. And you need to have those iteration cycles, the more uh, the, the more the better. So. Uh, the idea how you can use this in your uh, in your teams is uh, super simple. So you can have uh, milestones, you can have sprints, and you can have uh, specific time dedicated to polish and debug. So uh, if you have, for example, six months to do this project, to deliver this project, you can uh, break your work into, for example, six milestones. So six milestones for that will last a month. And then uh, in those six milestones, you can have three sprints that last for two weeks, and one of those sprints uh, can be a polish and debug sprint. I'll explain a little bit more. So the milestone is kind of like uh, biggest uh, chunk in your development cycle. It can align with, for example, first playable, uh, with alpha, with beta. It doesn't have to be. It can be smaller than that. But the important thing is 
that uh, before you start the milestone, you make sure that everyone is aligned what you want to achieve with that milestone. So in, at the end of this month, we want to have X. And everyone knows that the X is the end goal. That's your minimum viable product. And what it means is if we have this, we're okay to ship the game with it. If we don't reach this, we won't ship the game. If we go further than that, we're fine. But this is where we draw the line. This is our minimum viable product. We're shipping the game with this, and we're okay with that. So at the end of each milestone, you need to be able to define what's your end goal for that milestone. In order to, to, to make it easier to work in those milestones, you can use sprints. Sprint is basically like a mini milestone, <laughs> so to say. So you have sprints. Uh, sorry, in the beginning of milestone, you would define the work that needs to be done. So you would kind of, you can make it into tasks, you can make it into sticky notes on a board, whatever. But you have like art tasks, programming tasks, narrative tasks, whatever. You have them all uh, written down. At the beginning of each sprint, because you won't have a dedicated project manager or whatever, you will be able to take those tasks for yourself uh, and put them in your to-do columns for those two weeks. So from the backlog of tasks, uh, each of you can take and say, okay, I, I know I can do these three tasks in the next two weeks. And that is why, what I commit to. This is my responsibility now, those two or three tasks, maybe it's even one task, but you know, uh, you know your workload the best, you know how fast you can work and you can just use that. And also it, it's just important to, to remind you that you need to be uh, mindful of others and uh, that, for example, a, sometimes a programmer cannot start working on their task before the design is done. Sometimes art cannot start before the programming task is done and so on. So when you're deciding on the sprints, you probably should be together <laughs> and, and discuss the dependencies. And um, the polish sprint, so if you have two sprints that you work on full time, it's just production, 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 it would be really cool to leave the last sprint to not produce anything new, but to fix everything that you screwed up in the first two weeks. That's the, that's the general idea. So uh, four weeks of full production and two weeks of polish, debug, fine tuning, testing, reviewing, feedbacking, so on. So yeah, uh, this is a little bit what I talked uh, already. It's the dependencies. So you need to know what comes first, what comes second, who cannot work without what, and it, I, I won't go into so many details here, but just be mindful when you're uh, splitting the tasks of uh, yeah, uh, how, how you fit in together in the, in the pipeline. Cool, so if you take anything from this, anything at all, please let it be this. So review and iterate, review and iterate, review and iterate. That's the most important thing that you can take from this. The sooner you review your game, the sooner you ask for feedback, you will know if you're on the right path and sooner you can fix it and, and, and be aligned and move on and iterate and move on. So that's the idea. Uh, this is a little bit uh, what I talked about, but I just wanted to give you an opportunity to maybe see it into more detail. So we have milestone preparation uh, at the start of the milestone. So you define your MVP, you define your task, you put it on the board, and that's it. You start your sprint, you assign the tasks, and uh, each of the tasks that you assign to yourself should be delivered at the very end of the sprint. So if it's two weeks, you, wanna, you will not take a task that is longer than two weeks. It means your task is too big and you should split it and make it into something achievable in two weeks. Uh, it's really cool to have, I don't know if you will do it daily or bi-daily or every third day or whatever, but it's really cool to have some, something we call uh, daily sprints, uh, daily stand-ups, sorry. And uh, in daily stand-ups, it's like a 15-minute meeting with all the team Everyone just go around and say, okay, I'm working on this today, I'm close to being done, or I'm stuck, or whatever, and uh, I'm planning on doing this next. So that everyone is aligned, and you know if you're waiting for someone and they're stuck, you know to maybe change what you plan to do and do something else. It's just for visibility and for alignment of the team, so you're not making someone wait on something they, they maybe uh, should not. And you, you can take turns in leading those meetings. Uh, so every day it's another person who leads the meeting, sends up maybe a little bit of a follow-up, like this is what everyone said today, send a kind of, I don't want to say report, but send like a reminder to everyone what's, what's planned. Cool, so end of sprint, 
you do the review, you learn from what, you, what went wrong, what went well, uh, you realize if your estimates were good, if they were not, you uh, just, it, it, there's, n there's no failure. You, you need to fail to learn, but there's not, it's not bad. So if you screw up the estimates in the first sprint, you just need to do the review and realize, oh yeah, I should have added two more days to this, or we should have realized that these dependencies or, or, or whatever, and you just take what you learned and do it better in the next sprint. That's the, that's the whole thing. So you do the sprint two, do the review, and finally you do the sprint three, you stop the production, you don't add anything new, you just fix, uh, you review feedback, uh, catch all the bugs that you can, and try to, try to fix the game. So, uh, that's it. And I wanna give you some tools to do this. I don't think I have internet, that sucks, because I wanted to show you some of these links. Maybe we can, yeah. Don't worry, uh, I can maybe send you these links afterwards, so that's going to work. So uh, the important thing is to write everything down, uh, and I literally mean everything, uh, every kind of decision that you make, uh, every kind of, uh, of course, design, idea, every plan that you make, every commitment that you make, every feedback that you get, even that you give to yourself in brainstormings or, or whatever, please write everything down. And I don't mean just uh, like in your notebooks, but uh, share it somewhere. Uh, if you're going to use, for example, a Slack channel, have a, have a channel for, for meeting notes or general ideas. Just have a place where you have everything visible to, to everyone from the team. So it doesn't happen that like, you've been working on something for two weeks and you finally go to the team and like, hey, I did this, and everyone's like, no, we said it should be different. And uh, no one remembers why or where, where the decision was taken it's important to have something to go back to and look and like, oh yeah, this is what we, this is what we talked about. So these are, some, um, these are some softwares and online tools that I think you could find useful. So uh, for the documentation management, those are all of these, uh, well, except Google Docs are something like, uh, you can make wikis out of them. So you have a wiki for your team where you can store all the, design documents, narrative uh, documents, um, tasks, uh, every meeting note. So it's literally like, um, yeah, like a wiki. So I, I really recommend Notion. It's really good and it's really user friendly. And I think it's pretty. It has good uh, UI, so I recommend that one. Uh, then for task management, I'm not sure if you're gonna use that or you're gonna literally use sticky notes on the board. That also works. Uh, but uh, if you're going to use something online, there's uh, Jira uh, that probably everyone <laughs> at least heard of. Uh, there's ClickUp and um, those two are uh, pretty similar and uh, both are free for, I think, teams to 10 or 15 people. So everything is free to use and you can, uh, you can use those really, really powerful tools for free, which is cool. And then there's Codex, which I think it's just really cool and I want to support them. And I started using them for my personal projects. It's super gamified task uh, management. So you kind of make your deck. Uh, it's like a card game. So you make your deck of tasks and you can have decks for each team, for example. And in each team you can, you can make your own hand. So I have my own hand of tasks that I need to do for these days. And it's really organized like cards and it's, uh, it's really nice. So if you're working on a smaller game, uh, smaller scale, it really fits. Bigger scale, it really doesn't scale well, but uh, for, for smaller things, it's really cool. And uh, finally, something, uh, I don't know if you'll be working online uh, or, or, yeah. If, so if you'll be working online, I really, really cannot stress enough how Miro is cool. Uh, I don't know if you've been using it at all, but it's like, um, uh, it's like an online whiteboard that you can all collaborate together at the same time. You can draw on it, you can make plans, you can make uh, roadmaps, you can make design uh, pitches, um, like uh, vision boards. It's really so powerful and yet so simple to use. And before pandemic, we didn't use it and I have no idea how we, how we made any games without it. Like how, how we worked before Miro, I have no idea, but it's super, super important. And uh, the other two are, uh, they're kind of stupid, but I, <laughs> I use them. Uh, they're really cool for stand-up meetings, uh, for those 15-minute meetings that I mentioned. So 
uh, daily toast uh, is a, a timer for everyone so that we don't spend like 20 minutes talking for, for one person. It's a timer, but it works like a toaster. So it tells you when your toast is well done, or it's burnt, or where it's like black and unusable. So it's, it's just the timer that's cool. And uh, Wheel of Names is uh, something we started using to try and keep attention. Because sometimes when you have too many people in stand-up, uh, as soon as someone is done, they stop listening. <laughs> especially when you're online, it's, uh, it's hard to keep uh, attention. And Wheel of Names is a random uh, name picker. So it's a wheel that turns around and say, uh, Milica, and explosions. <laughs> and it, uh, it means that uh, it's me. And it's cool because it keeps you present, it keeps you listening, uh, because you don't know if you're going to be next. And it really helps to, to keep attention. So yeah, that's that. I'm going to send you the links uh, afterwards uh, so you can take a closer look at them and see if you will use anything. All right, so you lived through the project management phase. Congratulations. Now uh, I want to focus a little bit uh, on what producers do uh, regarding uh, people management and leadership in general. So uh, in Ubisoft, Producers are not just uh, project managers, not just uh, someone called, uh, I heard, Excel pusher. So <laughs> there, uh, there are a lot of misconceptions that project managers just do sheets, uh, but it's not. So in Ubisoft, producers really need to be uh, leaders in, in, in its true form, and they're responsible for the people they lead uh, in terms of their motivation, in terms of their well-being, uh, mental health, uh, per professional growth. You need to you need to take care of everyone in your team to, uh, to have a healthy team, healthy team that's working together and delivering uh, well in the end. And um, it's, it's going to be maybe a little bit tricky for you because you won't have a dedicated lead, but I really urge you to try and be that for each other. So to try and really like, give that um, attention to each other and be mindful of each other's personalities because you're all different, you all have different needs, you ha all have different um, priorities, so to say. So programming will want to use the high-tech coolest thing just to do it because it's fun. Uh, game design is going to want to have a super complex game that's no way going to be able to, to make in, in, in six months. And uh, I don't know, artists are going to use renders that last for three days or something like that. So you all have different priorities. Please be mindful that not everyone is thinking the same way that you do, and that it really takes a lot of effort to work in a, in a, in a, in a team of different people than, than you are. So because you won't have a lead to, <laughs> to do that, you will need to, to kind of do that uh, for each other. And uh, what I really want to stress out, uh, especially in this like, short burst of time when you will work super intensely on something, Please be wary of the, of the burnout and uh, try to manage your energy. It's, it's uh, an interesting article I, uh, someone shared to me the, recently. It's uh, about how we need to learn to not manage our time, but manage our energy expenditure. Because time is uh, kind of a fi finite, finite source, and uh, energy is renewable. So you need to be able to learn how to give yourself enough time to to recharge and how to organize your energy during the day so that you not spend it all on things that drain you, but also spend it on things that will renew your energy. So uh, I don't think I don't know if this is too, too abstract uh, right now, but uh, the important thing is be wary of burnout and burnout uh, uh, kind of um, symptoms because they can creep up on you. You can be so passionate and so eager to, to finish something, to work on something that you will not uh, recognize that you that you're getting uh, kind of burnt out by the end. Um, yeah, uh, check in. What I mean by that is literally that. Just check in with your peers in your team. Uh, ask them how they're doing. Uh, if you, if they need something, uh, meet them. Be there for them. So yeah, this, these are the kind of three things. Uh, it's uh, not, and uh, that's not, it's not something that, like super, super uh, out there. Uh, something that you can do is maybe set up a weekly or bi-weekly one-on-ones. That's something that we do 
in larger systems. It's like, for example, I have with my team bi-weekly uh, half an hour to talk to everyone from my team one-on-one, uh, -on -one, just to see how they're going, uh, how, how's their motivation, how they are as, like, as a human being. Uh, are they well? If there's something that I can do for them, uh, how they're feeling. It's usually not a lot of uh, project to talk. It's more like personal. So I think it, it could be really interesting if you maybe try and do that for each other. So have a meeting with each one of you maybe every other week or something like that. And you can do it in circles so that everyone has like a period. You don't have the same body every week, but uh, you kind of uh, do it in circles and you are there for each other just to check in. So you know you have a safe space, safe time that you know is for you to vent or to maybe just be hyped about something and share that. Uh, team building, I think it's, it can be really important for the team, especially uh, until you get to know each other very well. I think you would need more of these like uh, activities that are not focused on the project, just do something together to, 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 to bond basically and to meet each other. It can be completely uh, casual, like you have a, have a drink every Friday afternoon, it can be um, drink on Zoom or you can play, um, I don't know, some uh, online game or whatever, but you do something together that's not focused on the project because you need to, to take your eyes off of it. And uh, the, the thing number three is something that I maybe touched uh, earlier is, uh, is about uh, yeah, having different priori priorities, having different needs can turn some, sometimes to uh, overreacting on things and trying to put the the blame game on someone uh, when things don't go the way you maybe thought they should go. So just uh, just be mindful about that. It's uh, even if mistakes happen, it's not important who made the mistake, but what we learn from it, how we fix it for the next step. Just uh, kind of uh, try to have that trust even before you try to give everyone benefit of a doubt in the beginning. When you form trust, it's going to come, of course, much more naturally. But yeah, just be mindful of different, of different needs. Cool. And uh, I'm going to just maybe uh, kind of do a little review of what we talked about completely. So do iterate, of course. <laughs> I said it a million times, I'm gonna say it again. Just iterate, iterate, iterate. Do not be rigid with your design. Do not be rigid with what you meant to do. If you see it's not going well, be flexible uh, and uh, work on it, uh, change it. Fail and uh, fail fast. Do not be a perfectionist. Perfectionism is, uh, is killing us. And if you're trying to do everything to the max, everything to perfection, first of all, you're going to burn out. Second of all, you're not going to finish your game anytime so you need to know to recognize when it's good enough and good enough is really what you're going for especially with short time uh, to work on the game test the game show it to people do not hide it dare to try new things do not fear to jump into something new something you've never tried Ask being a part of a network. That's uh, something I, I often say in a, every time I get a chance to talk. Uh, it's important to, to ask people that maybe know more than, more than you or maybe just people from the outside. And, uh, but I especially mean this, uh, now today you met a lot of people from, uh, I know you met a lot of people from Ubisoft and those are really, really important networks that you made. So all of those people I know they would have uh, like no issues at all if you ping them and ask them for opinion, ask them for help, like, oh, I'm stuck with this, I don't know, uh, I'm stuck with this model, I don't know how to make a UV map, or whatever, or what, absolutely whatever you need. Do not hesitate to ask those people because it's really, uh, sometimes I know people fear uh, to reach out, like, oh, they are, they're super busy, they won't have time for me, uh, they don't know who I am, they won't remember me, or whatever. The, just push those thoughts back and uh, feel free to reach to everyone. It's really, as I, as I mentioned already, game dev is super open community. We all know each other, we all support each other and we really are so passionate about games, nothing else uh, matters and we want to help you make best games. So do not go at it alone. There's a huge support group that you have that you maybe don't know you have, use it. Cut. 
that is going to be most important for you, uh, especially when you're <laughs> closing to the game, because you will, as everyone does, plan for much more than you will be able to deliver, and you need to recognize when to cut and stop adding new features to the game. Start from the big picture. That's uh, maybe for the artists here, you know, when they say, do not start drawing a portrait from the eye. You know, so you need to start from the big shapes to figure out what's, what your concept is, what you want to achieve on the bigger scale, and then you go into smaller things and game, sim, smaller game mechanics, smaller features, smaller uh, fun stuff. Okay, uh, do to-do lists, make them visible to everyone. Do not assume people will know what they need to work on. Do not assume people will know that they need to wait for this. Do not assume people will know what's in your head and you imagine this and not that. Just write it down, share it with everyone. Visibility and transparency is extremely important. And uh, do vision boards. Vision boards are fun, they help with visibility. Do not repress your opinions. If you have anything that you want to share, do it openly, do not uh, hide, do not think, oh, if I say this, no one's gonna like me in the team. This is an opinion that's not popular. Just share it. Someone will use it uh, or give you a good explanation why it maybe doesn't fit with this game. Or maybe they'll be, oh, yeah, that actually makes sense and uh, we take it into account. So don't repress your opinions. You're all the same. You're all uh, the same group. You all go to for the same vision in the end. So, um, yeah, act like it. In terms of uh, what I said before, this is my email and this is my Discord uh, handle. So if you have any questions at all during the whole cycle, whenever you need, even after that, feel free to, to ping me, to uh, send me an email, shoot me a Discord message. I do use Discord, uh, I, I do prefer Discord over email, uh, but yeah, whatever works for you, uh, please do, do not hesitate. Thank you.